Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to talk about something that is sort of related to what Jessica was talking about, in that it's a, a housing issue. Um, but it's something, it's an effort that, am I not loud enough? <coughs> okay. It's an effort that uh, Council Member Mike O'Brien is leading, and uh, we're sort of supporting him in this work. And it's been going on for, for quite a while, um, and that is his effort to encourage, as Deb said, uh, more backyard cottages and mother-in-law units, and I'll explain sort of technically what those are. I hear the, the distaste for acronyms. You're going to see a few of them, but I'll, I'll try to be clear about what those are. Good. Thank you. Otherwise, we'll stop you. Yeah. Um, basically, what we're talking about are accessory dwelling units. So that's the acronym ADU. We generally use ADU to refer to attached accessory dwelling units. Those are the mother-in-law units that are within generally a single family home, often in the basement. Uh, often can't tell that one is there, so you probably walk by houses that have them and have no idea. Those are allowed basically in any single family house in the city, in any, any single family zone. Uh, detached accessory dwelling units, this is the acronym you'll hear a lot, and I'll use it a little bit just because it's short. Um, we call those DADUs, D-A-D-U. Uh, I generally do kind of call them backyard cottages more than, more than DADUs, but you'll see just that term because it saves space. Uh, those are separate structures. They're not attached to the house, um, obviously generally in the backyard. And uh, those are also allowed basically in all single-family zones, but subject to some requirements, and I'll get into those in a bit. Uh, they basically fall into two categories, freestanding structures uh, and then some that are built above a garage. Uh, and both of those are allowed. Again, we have standards for the size and the location and that sort of thing. On the right, you'll see just sort of a brief timeline of the, the main milestones of this program. So in, uh, over 20 years ago, we allowed uh, ADUs, the mother-in-law units, citywide. Um, and then it wasn't until 2006 when we had a pilot program for the backyard cottages in southeast Seattle. And that went pretty well. People were really happy with it. So in 2010, we expanded that to citywide. So any single family parcel, for the most part, can participate in this. Uh, a year and a half ago or so, uh, council passed a resolution that I'm said. Try again, because it's, it's, it's really, really hard, hard to see, to right? Yeah. Uh, a year and a half ago, council passed a resolution that uh, basically directed us to explore some land use code changes that could encourage more of these, because we haven't seen very many, and I'll, I'll get into that. Um, as of last month, in December, uh, we had 221 backyard cottages that were either already constructed or already permitted, and perhaps under construction in Seattle. We're looking at these changes for, for ways to encourage more of these, because as I said, we haven't seen very many. Um, and that's despite the fact that cottages provide a lot of potential benefits, specifically related to housing affordability. Uh, but where Jessica kind of focused on a lot of the sort of subsidized housing uh, approach to affordability, this is kind of a different angle. So it, it works in a few ways. The cottages themselves, and uh, mother-in-law units as well, when they're rented out, uh, generally provide an affordable housing option to a, sort of a range of different household types, household incomes, and often in neighborhoods that are unaffordable to those people. So in a lot of single family neighborhoods, renting or especially buying a house is out of reach for a lot of households, but some of these cottages are in the range where, where people can live in you know, a structure that has four independent walls, quiet residential neighborhood, they have some yard space. So kind of it meets a need that we don't see in a lot of other areas. The income from those rentals also helps homeowners. Uh, many of whom are maybe struggling to pay off their mortgage each month. Um, and so the income there allows them to remain in their neighborhood when they might be struggling to do so. Providing these units or, or allowing and encouraging more of them uh, gives a lot of folks flexibility to adapt to when things come up in life. And that can be a lot of different things. So maybe you have a relative that uh, you need to accommodate, you need to provide housing for, an aging parent, that sort of thing, uh, a child that comes home from college and needs a place to live, uh, or you want to provide rental income or uh, have the flexibility of extra space. And the, I've talked to a lot of people that have done these or are interested in them, and almost everybody cites multiple reasons for, for doing it. It's never just one thing. It's, it's uh, renting it out for now, but it's a place that a caregiver might live in the future or something along those lines. And then finally, because these are uh, being constructed on land that's already developed, um, 
and generally you know, served by utilities and infrastructure and often close to transit and services. Um, it's what we call infill development, so we're not developing new land. And it's, it's efficient. It makes good use of the resources that we already have. The map you see here is um, a little difficult to read, so I apologize. But the, the dark dots, the bigger dot, dark dots you see are constructed cottages throughout Seattle. So a couple hundred of them. Uh, and the, the main thing to see there is that they're pretty spread out. They're in every part of the city. Uh, they started in southeast Seattle with that pilot program, but now we see them in every neighborhood. We've done some analysis uh, of kind of how much capacity there is to do this in the city based on the requirements we have uh, in order to understand sort of the, the scale of the opportunity we have. Um, cottages, as I mentioned, uh, are allowed on any single family lot provided that it's at least 4,000 square feet. Um, it has to be outside what we call the shoreline district, which is parcels within 200 feet of Puget Sound or Lake Washington. They're not allowed there. And then they have to be outside some of the environmentally critical areas, like wetlands and steep slopes. Generally can't build them there. Um, and then they are subject to a range of development standards about the, the sort of form and location. Uh, and I'm going to get into much more detail about that. All of those things considered, we've done this sort of GIS analysis, and it's a little hard to tell the dark parcels from the light ones on there, but you're seeing 75,000 parcels where you could build one of these, given these criteria. So that's a huge, huge number. Um, just to kind of put it in context, if we could get only 5% of those lots to do one of these, and 5%, you know, 1 in 20, that's a pretty small number, relatively speaking, that would be almost 4,000 new housing units. Uh, many of them affordable to folks that um, might not have an option in that neighborhood or might be struggling otherwise, and uh, for no public money. You know, so when we were talking about subsidy before and kind of the limited funds that we have as a city, either to directly subsidize housing or through nonprofit providers, this requires none of that. Uh, currently, we're getting 40 a year. So not very many. So 5% so to get to 4,000, we're totally speculating here. So I, I've gotten questions in the past about, you know, how realistic is that? 4,000 would be pretty distant, you know, to get into that range. Um, but it gives you a, a sense of what's possible if we can make some changes that increase production. And that's what we're going to talk about. I should have said up front, uh, I'll get to questions um, that sort of outline uh, these different options for changes that we're considering, and that's what we want feedback on. And feedback and ideas about uh, what you think would work, and why, and concerns, and, and that sort of thing. We've tried to understand kind of that, that fundamental question, why aren't we seeing more of these despite the fact that you have 75,000 places where you could build them, and we have 200 of them built. Um, and so we've talked to folks that have done it, folks that have tried and struggled because of a few different really common barriers that come up, and those are sort of listed here. Uh, a bunch of people have lots under 4,000 square feet, um, so they're just outright excluded right now, but they, they would otherwise be good candidates for this. They might have enough space, literally, like have the space on their lot. Uh, they might be located close to good transit, so you know, they expect the tenant might not need a car, and so you know, it'd be a good place for them, uh, but they just can't do it. Um, and, you know, there are uh, thousands of lots that are in that range. Um, and we've been hearing from folks who say, you know, I'm, I'm really close. I'm at 3,900, but, like, you know, this is not waivable. There's no flexibility. Uh, parking. Parking is required. I'll get into that. But the, the parking requirement uh, is, a, is a big deterrent for a lot of folks. Um, it can increase the cost of the project to have to provide that sort of, you know, paving and infrastructure. Uh, affects your design for sure. Um, it adds impervious surface generally where then, you know, storm water can run off. Uh, so from an environmental perspective, it has that impact. And it often takes up space in your backyard and now you have, you know, a little bit more limited space if you're building a cottage. And some folks then have to go and kind of take up more of their vegetation or their garden and things like that to provide that parking space. Um, so some people do it and that's, you know, they sort of come to terms with that and then some people just shy away entirely because of that requirement. The development standards, um, which we'll get into in more detail, but generally we hear about the different ways that they uh, either sort of limit or outright preclude a design that really makes the most sense. 
Um, every site is different. Every lot is different in the city and the existing structures on that lot, that all varies every time. So um, there's all these sort of site-specific things that come up, but those development standards can make it difficult to get the sort of the most functional design for a relatively small structure where every square inch really counts. And then finally, there is an owner occupancy requirement. Uh, so the property owner current, under the current regulations has to live on site, and that probably more than anything else, we hear that that deters, prevents people from doing it. Um, and that is for a variety of reasons that I'll get into, but um, you know that's, that's one of the things we hear the most. <coughs> This is sort of the outline version of the, the broad questions that we are exploring and looking for feedback on during this process right now. So I'll just walk through them quickly and then we'll go into more depth into each one. Um, so we're, we're thinking about, should we remove the off-street parking requirement? Um, I'll add that currently there is the option for a waiver, but basically uh, only when the topography of the site makes it basically impossible to do it. So if you have that condition, um, you're not necessarily out of luck but it's not used that often. Uh, should we allow both an attached accessory dwelling unit, a mother-in-law unit, and a backyard cottage on the same lot? Currently, you can't do that. You can have one or the other. Um, and, oh, okay, we'll, we'll get into the details in a second. Should we remove the owner occupancy requirement? Uh, should we modify development standards? And this is sort of the, the, the main ones that we're looking at. There's a few that are, um, you know, nuances to all these things, but the big ones are the maximum height for the structure, a rear yard coverage limit, the minimum lot size, which I mentioned is 4,000 square feet currently, and then the, the maximum square footage for the cottage. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, code changes. Um, I also wanted to add that we're, we know that we have to go beyond just land use code stuff in order to have a meaningful impact here. Um, probably the biggest thing is the cost of these things is the biggest barrier to most people. So that, has, that does actually have something to do with the land use code because some of those development standards end up driving design choices that are more expensive. Uh, but, but overall, it's just an expensive investment and, and project to undertake. So we're also trying to find ways to make it easier for people to get financing. We're, we're, uh, Council Member O'Brien's staff is talking with local banks about ways that they could provide financial products that you know would, would be more accessible to people. Uh, that'll help more households do this. Right now, it's oftentimes folks that can uh, pay in cash or have enough equity to get a home equity line of credit. Um, so you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, that's just out of reach, even though it could provide a great benefit to them. Um, there are various permitting fees associated with any construction project. Some of them are city fees, and some of them are county fees, um, and we're looking at some of those for, for uh, ways to modify them, basically, to make it, to, to reduce them where it's appropriate, um, which is a challenge when it's not something in our control. So the, as an example, the county, King County, <coughs> charges a sewer capacity fee for any new construction. Um, it's $10,000, but it's over 15 years, so you pay about $57 a month if you build a single family house. But the same fee applies if you're building a backyard cottage. So you have a 400 square foot cottage or a 4,000 square foot new house, same fee. Um, so it'd be great if we could add a little bit of uh, rational approach <laughs> to that, um, but we don't fully control that, that fee. Uh, and then finally, we're, we're gonna try to provide resources that make it easier. So when someone gets the idea that they wanna do this, they know right where to go and they have a lot of uh, information uh, some example designs, um, things like that. It might even include uh, some, some designs that are sort of pre-approved on our end, so you can kind of somewhat take it off the shelf and just go with it. it. It may not be entirely without review, but some way to expedite and, and make that process more seamless. Most people that do this are sort of first-timers to, uh, you know, permitting through the city, so we want to make that as streamlined as possible. This will give you a sense of where we're at in this process. So as I mentioned back in, in 2014, council adopted a resolution endorsing uh, this effort. A couple times we've been to uh, the city council sort of for a brown bag. In December last month, we heard from four, uh, <coughs> four homeowners who have built backyard cottages to just have a conversation about their experience and you know advice they would have, the challenges they encountered. Um, Last night, we had a community meeting at the Filipino Community Center, uh, and we're gonna have another one in two weeks from tonight, 
in Wallingford, so February 3rd. Uh, and that's very similar content to what I'm presenting here. Uh, we have some boards instead of just a, a slideshow, but um, on February 3rd, Councilmember O'Brien will be there as well, so you'll have a chance to speak with him. And then uh, we are then looking to sort of take all this input that we've been getting over the last several months, and specifically from uh, meetings like this and the two community meetings, and develop legislation probably late February, early March is what we're thinking of doing that. So I'm going to get into more detail about each of those questions. Um, Do you want me to hand these out now? Sure, yeah, okay. Cindy can, uh, we'll pass out just a sort of a, a little half pager that has each question on it and, and sort of solicits your feedback. You can just, you know, give a little or a lot, um, and I can collect them at the end. Um, and there's a repurposed cookie bin at the front door. Yeah, the drop them off and I'll take those with me. Um, okay. Could we remove the off-street parking requirement? So it is currently required one space if you have if you build a attached or detached accessory dwelling unit. Um, and I, I sort of mentioned the, the impacts that that can have. Uh, the graphic here on the right gives you a sense of sort of how dispersed these things are in the neighborhood. So right now, we have one for every about 500 single-family lots. So it's hard to tell. This is a little red square. But that's sort of in your neighborhood. You know, that's on average the, the sort of frequency of, of these things that we currently get. And then these four that are, that are green are the mother-in-law units. We have about a thousand of those, mostly because they've been around a whole lot longer. So we've had more years to, to have those, to, to build up that inventory. So the parking impacts are, are pretty uh, dispersed and negligible relative to all the other activity that goes on on the street in, in single family zones. Um, in Portland, they don't have an off-street parking requirement, but a recent study found that despite that, two-thirds of their accessory dwelling units had zero cars parked on the street. So think about that. Two out of every three didn't have any car on the street, which means in those cases, either the tenant didn't have a car, which we know is you know increasingly common, um, or the tenant had a car and the, the property owner provided or was able to provide a parking space even though they weren't required to do so. So I've got about five more minutes of part of your talk. Okay, I, I need to speed know. up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can get the question. Yeah, I'll walk, I'll walk through a little quicker. So should we allow an ADU and a, a DADU on the same lot? Um, the, the main thing to consider here is that from the outside, walking by, you wouldn't really notice anything different. So these are, these are you know, all else equal, these are places where you could already have the backyard cottage, and you might see that looking down a driveway or something. But you generally won't see the, the mother-in-law unit as you walk by. So this is a house that has a backyard cottage. That's what you're seeing kind of on the left side. Uh, but they could also have a basement unit, mother-in-law unit, and you wouldn't really know. So the development standards kind of remain the same uh, even if we were allowed those units on the lot. We would want to consider uh, the household limits. So I'll just tell you right now, the, the household uh, size is any number of unrelated people or up to eight people maximum if, if any of those people are unrelated. No, you said unrelated, so say it again. Say it again. Yeah. Let me make sure I say it right. Yeah. Any, yeah, I said it right. Yeah. I said it wrong. <laughs> any number of related people. Right. So any number family, of related. Family can be as, as big as you need. Yeah, but if any one of those people living there is unrelated from others, the maximum is eight. And when you have an accessory mm -hmm. dwelling unit, it's considered part of the same household. So this, that limit is currently applying. You can imagine if we were to allow an ADU and a cottage, you know, maybe you have, maybe you start running up against that limit. So we're, we're thinking about what implication that has. Should we remove the owner occupancy requirement? Um, there is right now a waiver that uh, can give you up to three years sort of exemption from this if you meet pretty specific requirements. Um, but generally the requirement is that the property owner has to live either in the, the cottage or the main house for six months of the year. Um, basically, this deters some homeowners from, from building one of these because they, the future is uncertain for them. They don't know if they might move in three or four or five or ten years. And then if they do, they're faced with this dilemma of you know, ceasing to rent that unit or selling. And so a lot of folks don't necessarily want to sell. They might move away and come back. Um, it also makes obtaining financing more difficult than if we didn't have that requirement because appraisers and lenders don't look at the, your property as though it were uh, something where you could rent both units. So when they're taking into account potential income that they can lend against, uh, 
they're very wary of this requirement. Again, Portland kind of serves as a useful example. They don't have the owner occupancy requirement either, um, but that same study found pretty similar number. Over 60% of their accessory un uh, dwelling units have the property owner living on site. They're not required to do so, but two out of every three, you know, that's where the person lives and they're just renting out their backyard. Minimum lot size, 4,000 square feet currently, and that map shows you all the parcels that are between three and 4,000 square feet. These are places where currently you can't build uh, a backyard cottage, but if we were to lower that minimum lot size, that would be an option for people. Um, the main things to keep in mind here, uh, two things. One, a lot of these places are pretty centrally located neighborhoods because those smaller lots were platted sort of earlier in Seattle's history. So those tend to be areas that are uh, closer to a lot of business districts to transit. Um, and on smaller lots, all of the dimensional requirements, all of the standards about lot coverage and height are going to constrain the structure even more. Uh, so currently the height limit, for example, on narrower lots is lower. So if you have one of these tinier lots, you're not going to be able to build out structures on the entire property. The lot coverage limit says, no, it, it's, you, know, you, can't, you can't even go above half of your area. You can't cover it with a, a house or a structure. The minimum, this sort of illustrates that a little bit. So here's an example small lot, 3,000 square feet. So sort of the minimum that we're envisioning if we were to change it. Um, and you see the main house currently, uh, and that's you know basically as big as a backyard cottage could be. You're still required to have 10 feet of separation minimum between the house and the cottage. Uh, you're still required to meet all the setback requirements. That's five feet for the most part on, on the sides. Uh, and then the lot coverage limit is the main sort of governor that would prevent you from just expanding the footprint of that cottage outward endlessly. And how far from the owl? Uh, it depends a little bit. Um, if, if you're built above a garage, it's a little different than if you're not. The maximum square footage for a cottage currently is 800 square feet. Uh, but the, the challenge is that that includes any garage or storage space in that structure. So that's, that example in the photo, uh, and then these two sort of prototypes below, they show cottages that are, you know, the living space is built above a garage, which is a really useful and, and, and functional way to do it, especially if you need your garage, especially if you need to provide that parking. Um, but it immediately limits you. So if you imagine a 400 square foot garage, now your living space is, at most, if you maximize everything, 400 square feet. And frequently you have garages that are even a hair over that. So you're getting down to a zone where there's no way you're providing a second bedroom in that unit. So it, it sort of limits the, the people that that can be a useful rental for. It tends to exclude families with children my way over. Well, wrap it up. OK. Um, <laughs> and another thing to know is uh, attached accessory dwelling units can be 1,000 square feet, even if they're sort of attached onto the house as an addition. So sort of the same structure, but if there's a separation, the limit is lower. So we're, we're thinking of excluding the garage area and potentially sort of having consistency between those two attached and detached units. Okay, we're getting close. Um, the height limit uh, for certain lots uh, restricts, again, some of that useful living space. So on narrower lots, as I mentioned, it might be impossible, well, it's generally impossible to build even a one and a half story cottage because the limit is um, 15 or sometimes 18 feet. So it can, can be a real challenge. Similarly, for cottages above garages, because you have, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 feet in the garage, your height limit really starts to constrain how much space you have. I think this is the last one. The rear yard coverage limit it's, is 40%. So you cannot cover more than 40% of your rear yard with a structure. Uh, and it's an accessory structure. Your house can't be back there anyway. Um, the main thing here is that we have a lot of people that want to provide a backyard cottage for someone with limited mobility, someone looking to age in place, where a one-story structure is by far the sort of the optimal design. Um, but you often can't do it. You run up against that 40% limit. Ironically, even though you could kind of take that extra space and make it a taller two-story structure that might actually sort of be more visible to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're thinking of increasing that maybe just for one-story structures so that we're allowing those designs that might make sense for certain folks uh, to be available.
Okay, that's it. Contact info. Um, we have a lot of information on the website. You have, can sign up for our email there and I'll also get the contact list if you signed up here okay. and then you'll get updates from us. All right. Great. Thank you, yeah. Nick. We're going to get the lights on and we're going to do question and answer now for Nick. Can I again get a show of hands of how many people are going to want to ask questions? Good. We're going to change it up. We're going to start on this side and go that way. <laughs> Woohoo, I love it. So, uh, two questions to start out with you, sir, against the wall. Yes. Uh, comment and question. So, what you're basically talking about here is not so to single family neighborhoods. Well, they're because already they're increasing density. They're already allowed on all single family lots. Uh, one thing I haven't heard in this is the impact on neighboring lots in terms of height, coverage, etc. Mm -hmm. So, I think in all your analysis, you should really think what would be the impact on neighboring lots. Mm -hmm. That's definitely that's, part that's of it. That has an impact on real estate values. Mm -hmm. Put their money in there, their lives in their lots. Um, it's interesting, you say 220 have been built, but a recent article in Seattle Times indicated 267 of these have been built in Seattle. So I don't know where they're getting their data, but it's obviously disparate from yours. Yeah, I haven't seen that number in their articles. Yeah. And, um, is that your one question? No. This is connected. 80 oh. years. There's been no mention of increasing the allowable size of an ADU. A lot of big houses have an ADU. They're limited to 1,000 feet. 1,200 feet will allow an ADU to accommodate a small family, not just one or two single people. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these dadus are small enough. You're really talking about single people or two people. Mm -hmm. And what we really are interested in in Seattle, I think, is, a, is affordable housing Families. Yeah, one of the big opportunities here is to provide more affordable family size housing. But I think increasing yeah, the size we'll, of an ADU by maybe 200 square feet. And did you get your, your comment we'll sheet where you can place. write that stuff down too to pass it? bring a pen. We can get you a pen. I'll, Jim? I'll, I'll shoot it to his email. That's great. Jim? I guess the question the answer you had to make about what consideration you given to the neighbors and the impact that an ADU or a unit has on the neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, privacy and everything else. So if there's any consideration thought about that, all you're talking about now is the individual house that's going on that particular lot, and that was due to a neighborhood or to the joining neighbors. No, that's, that's a big part of how we look at all these changes to development standards. Okay, um, when do we have the opportunity to express the impact it has on us, the society and the bonding of the neighborhood etc. Right now? You can. But is there, that's are you asking, is there, there a process that's built in for public notification, right, things like that? Have you people even thought about it? I mean, you didn't hear it, but it doesn't do anything if you don't have any, you don't give any thought or consideration to that impact. Well, do you have uh, concerns about, in, on these particular changes, do you see some that are going to have a beneficial or negative effect? Every one of them will. Okay. Well, that's the sort of feedback we want to hear. So put that, so when you have that comment, put it down or take Nick's email and shoot that information to him. Be as specific as you can. Yeah, and I'd say as much as possible if you can say also why. <coughs> What's the sort of effect you're seeing? Maybe we can find a way to get the same benefit, mitigating some of that effect. Okay. Bruce. Is there anything to prevent when someone is uh, buying and flipping a house, prevent them from just adding a daddy in the backyard and therefore selling it, selling them all for more? I can see that being a business model for some people who are flipping houses and it seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, currently, they can't do that, but if we were to remove the owner occupancy requirement, some of these things are sort of framed as like a binary yes or no. But no, I'm, I'm talking about when they sell the home and they sell it to an owner occupant yep. and say there's also a cottage in the back that you can rent out, I can see where that would make Car them a lot more sellable. Yep. There might be too many. Why is that bad? Um, I'm not sure I know, but I just, uh, I'm not big on. Yeah, uh, I was just clarifying that currently they can't, a, a, a non-resident, so a developer who's not a homeowner developer, can't build an accessory dwelling unit. So it would come about if we were to change the owner occupancy requirement. But, but um, if, if you, if you, if you, <coughs> Bruce, trying, if, if you are somebody that buys the house from the owner, mm -hmm. and you now the owner, you build the unit on the, on the property and you flip it, you haven't violated the owner occupancy. Well, you don't just have to be the property owner. You have to be the. You have to occupy the structure. I know, but 
Developers typically don't do that. Uh, possibly they do. And I think this is exactly Jim's, Jim's concern. Your question is why is that bad? The impact on the neighbors. If that's not taken into consideration. Well, what, what I think would be useful, so what I was trying to say is we, some of these are sort of framed as like a do we do it or do we not? But really there's a whole middle ground of potential ideas and other creative solutions. So those sorts of ideas, you know, a lot of people have said, what if you had an owner occupancy requirement for some number of years and then it's sunset? <coughs> so then someone who needs that flexibility gets it, but it prevents the sort of thing you're talking about. So if that's a concern, that's the sort of thing we want to hear. Exactly. So be putting these specific comments in writing. Right. The Portland is, example is pretty useful. They don't have that requirement, but 80% of their accessory dwelling units are built by homeowners. Okay. Anyone else on this side of the room who has a comment? Sir, did you have a comment or question? No. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, now we're jumping here. Let's start with Ray. So, to follow up on that question, whether it be deed restrictions placed on a, a property that has a backyard uh, dwelling installed for subsequent owners to be enforced? For the owner occupancy? No, for the ADU or the DADU. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Would the owner occupant, um, would that restriction be put on the deed? So that subsequent owners would have to live there? So that someone that's who current, purchased... That's currently how it works. Okay. So the new owner sees yeah. it on yeah, the deed bought... and says, oh, I've got this, and there's a requirement to go and with you it. Actually yeah. have to, but you have to say that is for units that we know about. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Good question. question. Can I jump? I jump. jump. All right. So I have to public disclosure. I work for Jeff Tellman in the Rental Inspection and yeah. Registration Ordinance. And so I think a lot of your data is based on what's been permitted. Mm -hmm. And part of that program was to identify all of those units out there that are rental units but aren't necessarily on the books anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I have a concern maybe about the timeline of your your proposal because I think this is the year that, that the single units need to register under the RIO program. And so I would my comment would be just to work to maybe wait until that data comes in from Rio because I have a feeling there's a lot more un known, and that might be where the discrepancy is coming from. And maybe once you have better data, then you can look at those units that maybe aren't on the books, and there might be a way to make them legal, yeah. and that type of thing. So before changing everything, I think we need better data through that program. Back in 2006, uh, when it was first begun, there was a clemency program. Yep. Um, basically said, if you have one of these that's <coughs> grandfathered or illegal or whatever, right. uh, you know, come in, bring it up to certain codes, and right. it'll be legal. And we've thought about beginning something again to try to get more of those to comply. And I, I would second that. That's a very good mm -hmm. thing to have in the past, but to find out if the compliance has, has kept pace, my particular block, I can think of three. Yeah. The backyard cottages? No. Uh, it's ADUs. Yeah. So I guess you know, my, yeah. Uh, various types, mm -hmm. but that's three that maybe no one knows about. Oh, yeah. So I just don't want to so so my, my comment, and I'll write it down, is just if we can maybe slow down the process and find out what we learned from the Rio program, because I think this is the year that they register. Do you, do you have a sense for what sort of questions you would be looking for answers to in the data from Well, I think like we're going to find out there's a lot more of them already yeah. out there, yeah. and some of those properties that have been identified as potential properties probably already have them. And just to be clear, are you thinking mostly about attached uh, ADUs or, or backyard cottages? Um, probably attached. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, inside ones. And a little harder to hide a backyard point, cottage. What's that? A little harder to hide a backyard it's cottage. It's hard to yeah. hide a backyard but pretty easy to hide one inside the house. Totally. Yeah. And my, my thought is there's a lot of capacity that people might have one and they might not be renting them. And so maybe with a little work, yeah, you know, again, maybe it's not a matter of just adding a bunch of new ones. It might be tweaking ones. That what, what's a RIO? Did you say RIO? Yeah. The Rental Inspection and Registration Program. Okay. Yeah. So the single units, I think, mm -hmm. registered this year. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. it, 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 Nick, yeah. Nick, one correction. Uh, we have we own an ADU, and, and if your ADU is going to be within an urban village. The yes. parking requirement goes away. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I did, I did skip and, mentioning And the that. other thing is, is that, uh, you're really asking some people to be landlords, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, suggest that you have a little group that uh, might uh, answer homeowners that have these. It would, uh, you know, be 
a resource to people who are looking into doing this. Mm -hmm. Because, boy, you know, uh, we are landlords. And you really need to know what you're doing, or you can get yourself in big trouble and yeah. create all kinds of problems for your neighbors, is you not? Right. If you don't do it right. And the city Jenny. council needs to be very careful about some of these restrictions for landlords on screening people, uh, because that can really discourage people who are, especially if they're forced to register mm -hmm. and the books and governments looking in so on them. If they're not going to want to do this. That, so that sort of broad category of providing resources to interested uh, yeah. folks Good includes comments. things like Be sure like, you write those like down. That. Diane. Um, I love that this is being portrayed as increasing affordable housing, but I know for a fact that a lot of the backyard cottages are getting turned into Airbnbs, and we really need to be collecting data on this. I brought this up to Councilmember Nick Licata last year, and he said we need data. Mm -hmm. They won't do anything at a legislative level unless we have data. And I also know a number of really fabulous builders of backyard cottages who have told me that they cost between 150 to 200,000 to build. Mm -hmm. And so, how are they going to rent this out as an affordable unit to somebody like me that needs a little backyard cottage to live in because I'm elderly and on social security? Mm -hmm. We need to collect data. Yeah, we, we do have um, some good data of our own, and we, we know we see some peer cities that have collected better data, and, and we Who's can kind we? of. The, the city of Seattle. Okay, so I'm talking about you specifically in this department collecting data on the backyard cottages as and, and making that transparent mm -hmm. for the public because if all of these backyard cottages get turned into Airbnbs, it's not going to help with affordable housing at all. We have a couple of these. So when, when council first allowed these, we made a commitment to do this sort of biennial reporting and monitoring of all the cottages that are built. Uh -huh. So we've done, you know, it's been about four years, so we've done two two-year <coughs> reports. I have examples here, and they're both also on our website. So this is every cottage through So December if something's been converted to a BNB or used as a B, or an Airbnb, it would show up in that? No, not necessarily, because we, we, don't, we don't know exactly how everybody uses these things. Okay. Um, but that's what but I'm some, saying. You need to start collecting data and not whether they're being used full time or if they're being used two months of the year, whatever. We just need the data so that we, we know. What we did a survey um, to get a sense of, of uses, and definitely, you know, some people did mention that short term rental was in there. It was sort of part of that suite of, of ways that they were using it. And the mayor's office has directed our department to we work with council members on exploring Airbnb regulations. I know that. Okay. I'm saying collect right. hard data. Okay. Mm -hmm. that. Who else had a question? Here and then there. Okay. Um, so I will first off admit that I haven't had a chance to read all of the code of regulations. I'm um, just sorry to have to So it's possible my question is covered in there. But um, with regard to the parking space part, yeah. um, do you have to add a space or do you have to have a space? One of the things you grab in the slides I mentioned about Portland has having I'm assuming the one diagram there looked like there was a proximity requirement, but you couldn't say have two parking spaces at your house and say you get to have one of these. Does that have to be like right next to the additional building? No, uh, you just need to have one for the main house and one for the accessory unit anywhere on your lot, really? subject to all the requirements for where you can off park street. a vehicle. Off-street off street parking. I thought yeah. if you have an Sorry, yeah, no, it's not on-street parking. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's off-street okay, on yeah, your property. I was asking, because I don't know if the example you should also have it backing up onto the alley, for example. Yeah. Not all of them have an alley, so. Right, right. right. But so, you'd have to have two if you had the detached ADU and the main house, one for each. Did that answer that question for you, ma'am? Yeah. Okay, ma'am. I just had a comment um, trying to piggyback on the comments concerning people have different apps being landlords. And um, my husband and I rented a group over a three car garage in the beach. It's a short way to the nice community south of LA. Anyway, um, the landlord, when we went to rent the apartment above the garage. Could you start over and speak louder? Because I think the whole front row can't yeah. hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, I was just adding a comment that might add on to this gentleman's concern because he's known other people. And when my husband and I rented an apartment above a three-car garage in a very, you know, high, expensive neighborhood, where essentially the homeowners were using their um, backyard cottages to pay their property taxes and such, mm -hmm. we were asked some discriminatory type questions when we went to mm -hmm. check it out. Okay. And I questioned that, and I was very, but I was, what I learned was the homeowners could be discriminatory. A lot of the regular tenant requirements did not apply That's right. if the owner lived on the property. 
So owner occupancy and brought so some different things. It's a very, um, you know, safe and, you know, no one had issues. Uh, okay. They were going to get in trouble with cabins. And That's stuff. right. Good one. So front row heard that, yeah? Mm. All right. Who else on this side? Tamsin. Um, I just have a question about the um, um, question of the ADU and the BADU on the same uh, home mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. How is that going to be enforced? And I think it fits in with the um, requirement that unrelated people can be eight people only and related people can be as many as you want. How are both of those going to be enforced? I mean, I can see neighbors complaining and saying all kinds of things and there's nobody to go to to work that out. Um, when it comes to the household size, uh, you, we, we have a complaint-based system, generally, for all these sorts of potential code violations. So you pick up the phone and call and say, I, I think X, Y, and Z is going on at this place. Um, and then the you know, inspectors would pursue that. I didn't understand what the first enforcement issue you were mentioning. Having an ADU and a, a DA, having one in your home and outside mm -hmm. your home. We have a basement that's set up to be like an apartment. It has yeah. its own entrance. It has a kitchen. It has a bathroom. Mm -hmm. But we use it for ourselves, mm -hmm. and then if we were to build a cottage, how do you know that we're going to be using that for ourselves? We're not going to be using it for anybody else. Why would that not be okay to have both those? Currently, you're not allowed to rent an accessory dwelling unit and a backyard cottage under the current rules. And if if you thought your neighbor was doing that, that would be again, you know, something you could file a complaint <coughs> about. And if we change the rule to allow it, then it wouldn't have to be something that. We do enforce because it would be allowed. So that would, that basement would be considered an ADU, even though it's not being used that way. No, rented. No, no, only if you're renting. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's not. You're allowed to have it, but yes. um, yeah, not but rented as like a living but unit. But if you weren't renting it out, there yeah. would be a problem. <clears throat> That's right. And does your property taxes go up then? Um, they do. They can a little yes. bit, um, but because uh, the appraisers don't look at it as sort of two units that can both be rented, it's a pretty, very, very marginal change. Is Step Up still in the room? So there are some folks who actually are running workshops for people yeah. interested in doing this. Stefan mentioned that he's had two sold out sessions. So this is kind of your overview. You know, if you're interested in it, that's a whole different, you know, go talk to those folks. This is more about what does the city need to make decisions, so. Okay, over here, sir. So one comment, just um, I know you have to be able to talk to look at other cities and how they've done. And one caution I have with Portland is Portland has a train. So some of those things that you said are great. They don't occur here because we obviously don't have a train. Sorry, are you saying some train? Are you saying train? To the point that transit? Right, you mean like for 25 years transit. Transit. Yeah. transportation? Yeah. Fast. So some of the conclusions you make from Portland are not. Can't be Concurrency. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good one. Other questions on this side? Comments? All right, let's open it up. Who else has more? Jim and what is your name? I feel like I know you shouldn't know your name. Jim. How many? Jim there and Jim there. Go, Jim. How many uh, cottages would you allow in a block? So everybody had big lots and everybody wanted to put a cottage in the back in the backyard. Would you allow every property to do that? Currently, there's no restriction on what you can do based on whether a cottage is next to you or not. In fact, a lot of people, they see their neighbor building one and they say, hey, that looks great. I, I want to do one too. Mm -hmm. um, but that is so far beyond the rate that we've currently seen that, my gosh, if we got anywhere near there, I think we would continue monitoring and we could make changes if necessary. But that is like several orders of magnitude more. I don't think we could remove enough code changes to have that ever happen. Comment about your comment about what's the difference about 4,000 square lot and a 400 cottage paying the same amount for sewer rate? Mm -hmm. When one person's using the unit, the control units, we know different, the same amount of use you need, or so the rate should be the same. For the utility? Yeah, true, but you know, a 400 square foot cottage is probably one person, and a 4,000 square foot home could be more people. Could be, but it might not be. That's true, it might not be. And they could yeah, be tapping gym. into the same pipe. Right. Yeah, the so my, my comment is just the deal. In regards to the complexity of this whole subject, so many variables in slides. But it seems that the timeline you projected on the, uh, on, the, on the screen there was pretty short. Yeah. And not only that, but you had what I saw perceived as three meetings, stakeholders, whoever the stakeholders are, one community meeting down 
South Seattle, one community meeting in North Seattle, and then it's chugging off towards uh, uh, final review and completion. It seems to me that this is something that should be stretched out a little bit more. I mean, there's a lot here. You really haven't involved the community. You haven't engaged the community very much, given them any much of an opportunity to do so. And since it impacts the community so greatly, I think we should have an opportunity to really think about these things, give your office input, and have a little more time uh, before anything's implemented. Well, um, I'll take your comment down and, um, you know. I, why was it so short and why was community, direct community, well, the, community the, meetings so, so few and far between? The council resolution um, that sort of began this process was a year, about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. uh, about 17 months ago. So it, it's been ongoing for a while. We've had multiple presentations at council where this topic has been discussed. Where people have a hard time getting to it. Right? Yep. And yeah. also, this was the council that suddenly realized that we were going to district elections. So I think there was a lot they put on the table in this last year. year. Yeah. We need to get things through. Well, I would say for the time being, you know, this is a good time to weigh in with concerns that you do have. Yeah. Yeah. A question here, sir? If I got a detached unit, is that a separate power meter going to that, or is that kind of taking power off of your house? Um, that is a good sort of building code question. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's so often separate, separate and I, I'm pretty sure it has to be. Yeah. But it's going to be a separate meter then? Yeah. It has to be, yeah. right? Yeah. It was whether they had to have two separate electrical meters. You can have two meters. We definitely can have two. You can have, you can have a, a separate meter for the ADU, at least we do. Oh, definitely. But you can't separate the water, sewer, or garbage. Is that right? You know, that's a, um, the utility requirement because they got yeah. stuck with too many um, renters not paying the utility bills. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, the, the, so that's why they join yeah. them so that they make sure they get paid. Yeah. Was there a question up here? And then we'll go back to you. I just want to clarify, did I hear correctly that if I were to rent an attached or a detached unit as a renter, do I have no tenant rights? Uh, no, you have tenant rights. Um, Is but it the same as renting an apartment? Well, the, the main difference, the difference that um, that person was mentioning is that the landlord is allowed to do a different, little bit different screening process. Well, that's what I'm asking. So what protections do I need, not have as a renter of one of these? Well, there's more to tenant protections than just the screening process. Mm -hmm. there, are pro there are protections that deal with eviction and r those sorts of things. Um, the reason it's a little different is that the landlord is also the person living 20 feet from where the tenant is, which is different than a 100-unit apartment so building. So they could say, I want a boy or a girl? I don't. Okay, they, I, I don't want children. I don't know the full them. ins and outs of what's allowed in this case that isn't generally, and I'm happy to look into that. And, that would and be let good you know. for you guys to be in yeah. touch to find out about it, because that might be something that's interesting to have on the books. Do we already? I've written it down one? to add to okay. our FAQs. So, so, isn't there a wasn't there a limit on how many cottages we build every year though? During the pilot phase, yes. Yeah. Oh, so there's no limit now that there was. No. Limit. That's right. And you didn't get the limit on the pilot phase. No. It was 50 a year. We've never had 50 a year. That's correct. Delma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had one other general general comment, and I think it's kind of what another gentleman said earlier. It's just, you know, we're in such a rush to build the housing that I do really worry about the environmental impacts, like the storm, increased stormwater impact. There's less pervious surface. You know, there, we have a tree ordinance now where we're trying to improve our tree canopy, and I wonder with all this housing if we're giving up on that. So, well, the, the interesting thing yeah. with this is we're not really thinking about changing lot coverage. So everything that could be built <coughs> under... Um, the 40%. That's the rear yard coverage. Okay. So, um, so it would just sort of change where your allowable coverage could be. Right okay. now you're restricted about where it can be in your rear yard, but it could be outside your rear yard. But okay. the, real, the real sort of limiter is the lot coverage, okay. which says you can <coughs> only cover... <laughs> 35%. Um, it's a little higher if you have a tiny lot, but generally 5,000 square feet and up, it's 35%. You can't build over more than that. So we're not increasing that. We're not changing that. Okay. You know, if, it, if it's a backyard cottage, that means that person could have also torn down that house and just built a giant right. house okay. up to that limit. Right. So it's not, it's not like a, we're not really on that lever with this particular topic. Okay. Thank yeah. you.